Right, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you very much actually for inviting me and uh, for sticking around. I mean, at this point, I think after seven uh, talks, we probably are all pretty tired. Um, I am one of those. Uh, now, this is a joint work uh, with uh, Melvin Coles, and differently from some of the Polish papers we have seen so far, this is pretty much uh, work in progress. So any good comments, good comments. Uh, would be highly appreciated. Now, what sort of questions are we interested in uh, attacking here? Well, the main question really we are looking at is um, to what extent can the rise in, uh, in uh, uh, education and labor market participation we have observed uh, between the 1950s and the 1970s in the US, maybe true in other countries as well, but definitely we are focusing on the US can be associate, associated with uh, innovations in, uh, in the uh, contraceptive uh, technology or uh, can be associated with other social or cultural forces. Now, I'll, I'll be precise exactly what we mean by uh, social forces. Uh, so in order to be able to address this question, we are basically uh, trying to uh, provide a simple economic model uh, which allows us in fact to answer these questions first of all theoretically uh, and then we'll try to take a little bit of this uh, to the data that's where exactly we are pretty much uh, uh, short of. Uh, so th the economic model is a new uh, equilibrium search and matching model and we are embedding within this model both uh, contraception technology as well as the equal rights movement uh, which is what we have in mind uh, for social and cultural change. All right, so uh, the, um, and as I said, bef uh, when, when, when we have sort of specified the model, we are then trying to, I think calibrate is uh, too much of a word. Uh, I am not a calibrator myself, and uh, uh, I think we are trying just to illustrate uh, some of the properties of the model through some simple uh, calculations. Uh, now, motivation of the work um, is actually going to go through some simple facts, uh, some of which I think are familiar uh, to all of you, others probably are uh, slightly less. And we are going to be using data from the census uh, of the US and from the uh, National Survey of Family Growth. Uh, so the first sort of uh, uh, thing that mm, most people will know is uh, the fraction of college graduates, women uh, college graduates. Here we are selecting ages between 25 and 34 in each of these cross-sectional uh, points uh, between 1940 and 2009. And uh, as we can see, uh, again, this is something that most people will know, um, we, we, we have seen, we, 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 have, we, we are observing a pretty steady increase of uh, women's uh, uh, getting college um, education. And we are starting seeing it probably uh, from the 1950s onwards. But it's uh, an awesome increase for men. Right? Yes, 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 yes. But sure. Yes. You know, it, 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 increase, it increase for men too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we'll probably have to wait mm -hmm. there uh, to, to, to see that um, overtaking. But, you know, I mean, Absolutely. It's, it's inconsequential for what uh, we are going to be interested in. Now, the two sort of vertical lines here are just to uh, guide you in thinking about those years as being the years in which the peel was introduced. So, as you can probably see very easily, uh, is that the, this increase happened well before the introduction of the, uh, of, of the peel, and presumably uh, it continued uh, even after it. Uh, even after it was, uh, its use was actually widespread uh, among. among uh, as I, well, probably these would have been the sort of, it's not necessarily the last year, but it's a year after which 
the, the, the prevalence of use of, of, of the pill was pretty much uh, um, you know, mm, spread around most of the uh, population in the US. Of women who would have had uh, this particular issue. Well, it was, probably, it, it, was, it, was actually, it was actually invented even earlier. And as, the, you know, as people who have studied the pill uh, within the economic environment have illustrated, you know, it took actually probably about a good 10 years before it was really available uh, to everyone. That's why we're sort of pretty conservatively picking the starting as the mid-1960s and the ending of the diffusion uh, of it by the end of the 1970s. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. All right, so then another uh, statistic here, we are going back uh, quite a lot. I mean, you know, the, the, the educational data are available in, uh, uh, in the census, uh, piece of information, in the census samples from 1940, but uh, employment rates for women are available since the 1860s. Um, we can actually trace, therefore, uh, employment rate, labor market participation, uh, um, of, of women from 1860 to again about 2009 for both sources. And as you can see, yet again, uh, we are seeing a, a rapid increase of uh, uh, labor market participation from the 1950s onwards. Probably, again, this uh, was predated uh, by some time. Uh, so it started well before the introduction and diffusion uh, of the pill, and it kept going. Maybe here it's something that we know a bit less about. Uh, this is conditional on having a child, the age at first birth uh, by mothers. Uh, from here it's the year of, of birth of the mom um, for both sources, census and NSFG. Uh, we have basically a pretty flat uh, profile um, of the age at first birth. So from 1830 to basically the 1970s, uh, by birth cohort, um, we have a median age of about 24. And uh, this is the 90th percentile. The 90th percentile is about 30. And the 10th percentile is about 19. Um, so then we say, OK, let's look at stuff by education. This is huge conditional having a child, eh? Yeah. So we see this huge decrease in fertility, right? Um, so we, I would expect to see this age. Age at first birth. This is conditional on having a kid. It's conditional on having a kid, and it's age at first birth. It doesn't mean that you know the total number of children that uh, um, a, a household is generating is necessarily the same. It's simply that maybe the spacing is different, and maybe the total fertility is actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. You'll, you'll see, absolutely, you'll see a little bit of that here, right? So here we are looking at the median age at first birth. We are again centering around 24, 25, but there is a little bit of spread by uh, educational levels. So high school dropouts will be down here, while uh, college graduate women will be up there. Uh, and then if I go through the 10th percentile, you see a shift down uh, of the whole distribution by, uh, 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 over time. And if, if I go to the 90th percentile, I see a shift up uh, of the whole distribution. So no doubt that more educated women tend to delay uh, their first birth. They're around here rather than being around there. Um, but apart from probably something for the college graduates, we don't really see a sizable increase in their age at first birth for over 150 years. So is this problematic? Because would it be problematic if women stop their education when they have their first birth? So that women would go to college until they had uh, a child and then drop out? That's right. Does this change the interpretation? Of it, it, it would. I mean, presumably there are not that many that are going to be changing uh, you know, these statistics so dramatically. I, I, most of the, you know, in fact, even in the model, we are basically assuming then, uh, well, the, the, the investment in education predates actually the, 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 the fertility decision uh, or the marriage decision. But uh, yes, I mean, that would, would, would change the interpretation. Okay, so these are um, 
sort of uh, the, 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 the background facts that we have in mind when we are going to be uh, thinking about uh, modeling behavior. And as I said, you know, age at first birth, uh, conditional having a child has barely changed since the 1850s. Uh, and it has also gone through many contraceptive technology innovations. Uh, rubber condom in the 1850s was one. Uh, the latex technology in the 1920s was another one. The legalization of condoms in 1936 was another one. And finally, the pill. Uh, so just to, j just to uh, make sure that we are on board, as you can see, you know, in a sense, this would be the, one of the pictures that we might have in mind. Age at first birth, conditional having a child, has, has barely changed. Now, I, I haven't really uh, indicated here, uh, you know, I only indicated the 1850 or 1860, I should say, uh, um, you know, introduction of the, of the rubber condom. Uh, we have other, other uh, uh, innovations happening uh, over the first 30 years of the, 19th, of the 20th century. And again, we can see that those have had barely uh, a, any consequence on the age of first birth. All right, so then what we do is, uh, we, with, with this piece of information in mind, we, yeah, yeah, sure. You say birth, I mean, you couldn't have picked the scale to make it look flatter if you tried. <laughs> say it again. What is, the, what is the change over, say, the 50s, uh, or, or over the, the, between the lines, not maybe on this one, but on some of these, I mean, I don't know what that. You want to you wanna have, you want to see, Three, say, for this particular age group, for this particular uh, educational group, it's it's probably it's probably one and a half, yeah. So there is, as I said, there is actually this is the median. Uh, there is some increase for college graduates, right, in the age uh, at first birth, but it's not a revolution. I mean, and what we are trying to understand is whether these sort of uh, uh, changes can actually square with these sort of changes. Is this, are these facts per se in Europe as well? I don't know. And also it might be uh, completely as an extreme. There was this massive demographic transition mm -hmm. in Korea. Yeah, yeah. They, have, they went from six kids to 1.1 1 .1 in about 20 years. Yeah. It might be nice to see. To see if it, if it yeah, carries over. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't know. and. Uh, uh, I mean, we could have the data. I mean, certainly for, for Britain, I'm not sure about Korea, but certainly for Britain, we would have the data. It's not straightforward to get all this uh, data on, on age at first birth from these particular sources. I mean, the NSFG is much better. The census data is problematic. I'll tell you later on over a beer uh, or a dinner um, uh, if you're interested. So you're looking at like age 40 and over for women? Or yes, women? yes, exactly. Okay, um, now, um, so let's, let's start with the model. Um, we have a simple uh, search and matching model. We are in a continuous time environment, infinite horizon, agents are, are infinitely lived, and we look at only steady states. The partnership will involve only one man and one woman, and uh, uh, we have an, an equal number of unpartnered men and women in this single market. The rate at which uh, people meet uh, in this singles market is gamma, and R is the discount rate. Now, uh, the, the, the male side of the market is very simple. Uh, presumably, it approximates reality uh, quite a lot. Uh, men are just, are, just are just characterized by one number, uh, by one statistic, which is their earnings. And, um, and this earning distribution, kept Y, uh, has got a finite support uh, between Y under bar and Y upper bar. Women are slightly more complicated. Uh, and um, so this, this male income, is it a genetic intersection? It's not, yes. It's not random across their life cycle. No, that's right. Um, yes, yes, it could be. Um, now, uh, women instead have got two attributes, two uh, traits that are going to be relevant in this, in this model. One is ability, which uh, 
we label alpha um, and n is attractiveness um, in, in other contexts perhaps you have you know for those of you who are familiar with this sort of literature people have called it you know one of my co-authors have called it pizzazz Golden and Katz called it nurturing skills we are trying to match uh, we are trying to match in fact not just the terminology if you want but even the notation of Golden and Katz uh, and we call it L yes uh, Victor Yes, yes, absolutely. And, with the, and there is, in fact, an extra element here, which is not just pizzazz, but it's, also, it's not just attractiveness, no, but, but, it, but it's also ability. Yes. Ability also. Of oh, the woman, yes. I mean, in, in Bardet calls, you only have one characteristics of the woman, which is her desirability, if you want, her attractiveness in the, in the marriage market. Here you have also her earnings. Yes, 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 absolutely. Yes. Well, you'll see, you'll see, I mean, it, it depends because you see, I mean, there, there is going to be an environment, the equal opportunity uh, environment, if you want, or the, uh, you know, the, the world under the Equal Act, right, the Equal Rights Act, uh, which, which is going to have both edges, both ability and attractiveness. And men, of course, will, will be able to choose depending on those two characteristics. Well, 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 do men agree on who, oh, yeah, yeah, who yeah, is yeah, most yeah, 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 when we have the two together? Yes, okay. yes. Gustavo. Yeah, no, no, no. yeah. All right, so each woman then, uh, with uh, characteristics alpha and n, will make an education choice before entering the labor market. And uh, this is just a, a dichotomous. Uh, uh, decision zero one she's either educated when e is equal to one or uneducated when e is equal to zero the uh, decision of of, of uh, uh, making an education I mean, of, of getting educated comes with a cost c uh, which is bigger than zero and uh, that's that's capturing the cost of investment now if uh, a woman therefore uh, you know in the labor market, she will be characterized by her earnings, W. Her earnings will be uh, equal to uh, Y under bar. Remember, the, 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 the minimum wage available, uh, uh, observable in the men's distribution in the world in which there are unequal opportunities. In the world in which where there are equal opportunities, her wage will be equal to her ability, alpha, if she's uneducated. If instead she chooses to uh, get an education, uh, her, um, her wage will be equal to uh, lambda alpha, where lambda is the wage return to education. To make it very simple instead, in fact, with the uh, math later on, you will see it. Uh, we, we'll, we'll make quite a few, in fact, uh, um, assumptions of this sort, just to make it very simple and to get very stark um, you know, so implications. A highly able, able, able woman could conceivably have the lowest possible earnings. Yes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, alpha, uh, you know, is 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 is, is uh, free to move uh, all over, right? I mean, you, it's it's by no means necessarily uh, only about uh, y bar, y under bar. I mean, you're Johnny? being very stark. You're saying that. An unequal world is one in which women's ability does not matter, and all that matters is their attractiveness. That's right. So you might as well just say that. And yeah. in, a, in an equal world, it's... Oh, it will, it, it will come very, very clear right in a second. Yeah, it's already, it's already very clear here. It will become even more clear when, when, I'm, going to go, when I'm going to go there. So from now on, basically, uh, we are taking the exposed characteristics of a woman to characterize her in the marriage market, so her wage and her attractiveness. Uh, so as I say, uh, we are going to be looking at two. Why in an unequal world, doesn't matter? Because everybody will get Y lower bar. Yeah. No if, if there are unequal opportunities, her wage will only be maximum, uh, the lowest observable wage of the man. 
Good, so uh, we are going to be then looking at two particular uh, scenarios, one in which there are equal opportunities and one in which there are unequal opportunities. The world with equal opportunities is the world that sort of approximates the uh, Equal <coughs> Rights Act, post-Equal right, right, equal, equal Rights Act uh, period in the, in, in the US, and, and, and that in a sense is what we think of as having this cultural change. Yeah, okay. I think that you might have wanted to also grasp the skill premium for women, mm -hmm. at least from the 1940s onwards, from which you can get the data. Sure. And you will see, you know, there is a substantial skill premium. So, I, you know, it's somewhat problematic because you're, you can say, you can, all of a sudden your ability is going to matter in this equal rights world, and then you're going to want to go to college. Okay, but your, your, your ability also didn't matter before. Less, I grant, you know, I grant. Because they didn't want to stay in work. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why would you really matter if you didn't want to work and start thinking about children, transmission of immunity? Yeah. But it's absolutely. Not no, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, we, we are trying to, to, you know, to characterize a very simple, stark environment here where we want to get, uh, you know, much of what we are interested in in a very simple way. I agree that, you know, of course, even before uh, equal opportunities, in a sense, not only uh, attractiveness matter, also ability, and you know, and other dimensions of uh, you know of, of of not just a woman but also a man would have mattered. Uh, here we are oversimplifying uh, what, what's happening, but we want to. I, I think we are pretty able to characterize what 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 happened uh, over those 20, 30 crucial years. Yeah. Right. yeah, but I think this is related to what Raquel is saying, you know, in a sense, the skill premium uh, to education might have changed uh, and, you know, and, and, and has been probably rising well before the introduction of the PIL, if you want, and, and has continued. Can I, yes. let me, let me follow up with Raquel's question. So there's all this interest as to why uh, women in countries where the base never work education and why that's valued in the marriage market. And of course it's valued because not only a great marriage but also education might matter mm -hmm. for kids. So, so it's not a big return in the marriage market to obtain education. So the, what's happening in the labor market is I agree. I agree. I mean I, I agree. We are shutting this we are shutting this down as as it has been clear now. Uh, and you, you will see, um, you know, uh, we'll say it very explicitly, it's not that we are hiding behind. I mean, it's, it's exactly what characterizes uh, the unequal opportunity world here. And uh, yeah, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure to what extent this would undo what we are going to be saying uh, if these women are not allowed to be basically in the labor market. Um, although I, I can see that uh, the, the patterns of, uh, of, uh, of, of matching in the marriage market may be very different for women who get an education. Okay. Yes. Uh, to go to instead is to say, well, uh, the normal uh, change of opportunities is uh, uh, the new age. Mm -hmm. uh, and maintain this lambda thing yeah. to bump up your wage. You could, could do that in the 50s, you could do that in the 80s. It's just that uh, your wage is going to be multiplied by some factor in the 80s relative to what it was in the 50s. You would get, in, in that model, it goes up the cost, the fixed cost of taking education you would still get a rise in education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I think that a lot of the, the facts you showed us are going to survive. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. I mean, it's, as you will see, I mean, you know, um, the model is relatively simple. Uh, we're not able to prove uniqueness, uh, but, but, but uh, the model is relatively simple and, and is able to deliver some interesting you know, implications. Um, maybe we want, we want to make it richer. Uh, by, by adding education also, biting uh, even before the, uh, uh, the equal opportunity um, environment. All right, so with, uh, with, with equal opportunities, um, you know, we are going to have two particular aspects of, of women behavior that are going to be affected. Equal, 
the, culture, the equal opportunities will, will increase the wage of women uh, when they are single, and this will tend to delay marriage. And then uh, it will also increase uh, their values in the singles market, and so men will also look at them not just through their desirability and, but also through their improved earning power. Okay, so we illustrate this with, uh, I mean, we, we are going to be looking at, at a specific model where we're going to have very uh, specific, simple payoff uh, structures. And so here is the lifetime payoff for male, while, and the woman, WN. Uh, these are given by pi M for a man and by pi F for a woman. Um, this payoff will depend basically on, uh, uh, on the um, joint earnings, um, the, the man's earnings plus uh, the, the um, woman's earning, uh, which is going to be um, uh, either the total amount of, of earnings that she receives net of the childcare cost fee, or it's going to be zero if she, if she doesn't work. Now, um, besides, besides this, uh, the, uh, you, the payoff of a man depends on the attractiveness of the woman he's matched with. Uh, the net, uh, the, the, the flow of payoff to uh, forming a family, F, and uh, a love match. Um, the same thing happens for, for, woman, for the woman, of course, in her case, there is only one characteristic that she's looking at from the man's side, which is why all the rest is pretty much the same. And F is assumed to be the same for both men and women. Uh, of course, she's going to have a different, uh, a different love shop. She doesn't have to worry about her appearance. Uh, she doesn't have to worry about our appearances. Yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and you know, perhaps that's where uh, the, the, the symmetry will have to be added, but that's not going to be an easy thing uh, in terms of modeling. The only other sort of thing I want... That's, that's why you avoid this kind of two-dimensional matching. Exactly. I mean, you know, we, we have two-dimensional matching. It's actually for the woman that we have it, but not for the man. Okay, so the man has got only one characteristic, but the woman has got two. Yeah? Now, uh, the, the only other different thing from probably what you have seen in other environments is this beta parameter, which is sort of a deflator. Well, this is kind of added, right? So yeah. N and Y are perfectly separate. Mm -hmm. So I can put them together. So effectively, it's one dimensional. Yes. Yes. Uh, now, beta is, is this deflator that accounts for family size, and uh, it's basically take account taking into account the, um, um, you know, the, the um, economies of scale or uh, equivalent scales within a household. So if beta is equal to 1, uh, it's as saying that 2 can live as cheaply as 1. If beta is less than 1, then there are equivalent scales. And so a, a partnership on, on joint income Y will be uh, similar to a, to a single uh, living on, on income B Y, beta Y. All right, so here it's again notation, but uh, the, the um, um, love draw is actually coming from a particular distribution H with uh, uh, positive support. And uh, the important bit that we've got to add is that the flow payoff to a single individual uh, is going to be... Yeah. Oh, it's, 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 it's true, but uh, from, f from the viewpoint of proving uh, existence, this makes it very simple. And so we are using that precisely for this Wait, reason. Purely idiosyncratic for the match. For the match. Yes. But, but Y and N could be all put into one index. Yeah. And, and, and they will. And yeah, rename. indeed they will. Okay. They will. Um, okay, so uh, the only other thing that I wanted, in a sense, to emphasize is that the, uh, um, the flow payoff to either a man or a woman uh, is actually going to be um, 
uh, enriched by a component u and u is basically this flow payoff of remaining single so in a sense that's exactly the way in which the uh, contraceptive technology improvements are going to be uh, coming into the model so if uh, if there is a an improvement like the pill then uh, this will will come with an increase in u okay so both this component uh, and this component will have to be raised by you. So does it matter that this increase in contraceptive technology doesn't make you better off if you're married to? Um, you can be able to control your fertility so you can have a career, maybe it could. It, absolutely, it could. You know, in 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 uh, in reality, this is undeniable. In the model, we just take a very simple uh, view, and again, you know, we are getting it from golden cats, and you know. The, their idea of what the pill did was simply to make uh, the value of being single higher. And that's the way in which we are modeling. We are, um, you know, we are agnostic about other things. You know, of course, we, we know that this is not going to be the whole story. But that's what, what we are going to be doing. Uh, so you know, for the model, I mean, I'll go very quickly because, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, good, good for this section only. <laughs> uh, so, so the the uh, for the model we basically need four objects to define equilibrium, and these four objects will be uh, defined in a second. Uh, we just have some some notation about uh, uh, you know what we need for those uh, for those definitions. I mean, so distribution of male earnings cap y, the joint distribution of female uh, attri attributes n. Uh, and then, as I said, contacts are random. People are randomly meeting in the singles market. Uh, these meetings occur at a, at a rate gamma. Uh, given contact, each, mates, it's each, each match person observes the other characteristics, Y and WN, as well as the love draws. And uh, if these last draws are sufficiently high, then the match is formed, and uh, they both have to agree. If one of the two doesn't agree, then they continue searching. So, is there something uh, presented in this way sort of obscures everything, I think? Yep. Uh, what that calls has that interesting property of, this, of the classes where... Yeah, yeah, you'll generate it here, too. That's, that's generated here, too? Yeah. So what you want to talk about is how the classes, the shape of the classes change. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether I, I, I'll, I'll go there, but you know the, the class system is generated here as well. I mean, you can generate it here too. Uh, or do the lab draws interfere with that? No, 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 they don't. They don't. I mean, the lab draws are really used primarily to get to get uh, the, the the proofs of the existence as simple as we can, and it's actually, you know. Melvin claims it's a very neat uh, proof. It's his best sort of proof so far. I'm not sure whether it's, uh, it's, it's, it's true. But it's true that uh, you know, it's, it's relatively simple to prove it when you have the. What you want to tell us is whether the, the option of, of women to be educated, whether it increases the number of classes, shapes them in a different way, makes them of different size. That's what I think is most interesting rather than go to the. To the we're surely already well crafted. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, I, I agree. I agree. No, no. I, I think that that's a dimension we are not doing so far, and I think it's it's probably a, an interesting way of thinking about how the model uh, can be tweaked or can be pushed to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, what we have tried to look at, as you know, we go back to the motivational question at the beginning. We were trying to pitch, you know, one uh, innovation technology on 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 one side versus something else, something more complicated, like cultural changes that happen pretty much in the same period as the introduction of the pill. That's where we pitched it at. We wanted to understand whether uh, you know, the pill itself could have been, can be, uh, you know. It's not the pill itself. It's whatever makes the single better. Yes, exactly, exactly. Exactly. So that was, that was, in a sense, the, you know, and that still is, 
in the paper that has not been written yet, the motivation. Uh, now, how exactly uh, we want to describe the properties of the model, I think that this would be an interesting way of, of thinking about it. W is A, yeah, is alpha, yeah. Um, all right, so, um, yes, Yora. Is what? Three men. Duty is, is a sum fixed. Yeah. And they can influence before the end of the marriage. Yeah, they can, they can, they can affect W. So at the end, uh, ugly women will take more education. You know, and the ugly women? Uh, it depends. It depends on whether or not they have opportunities in the labor market or not. So if they have opportunities, they do. You would see. Yeah. 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 So, um, so if the match is formed, then they exit the singles market uh, forever, and uh, they immediately have two kids: uh, a son who inherits the characteristics of the father, and the daughter who inherits the characteristics of the mom, and then there is immediate replacement. And uh, uh, because we are considering steady states, this is not really a big loss in generality. Now, here we are finally with, uh, with the uh, environments we're interested in. So first, let's characterize the world where there are unequal opportunities. Uh, a woman can only earn Y under bar. Since the childcare costs are bigger than uh, Y under bar, each woman will withdraw from the labor market when they're married. And, uh, because the return to education is zero uh, and education is a costly investment, then uh, uh, education, I mean, then being educated is a dominant strategy. So the match payoffs will basically reduce to these two uh, different pies. And apart from the love draws, uh, so if you set these two, theta m and theta f, to zero, uh, these payoffs are exactly the same as the one that you have in Golden Cuts as well as in Burdett calls. So indeed, uh, this particular world with unequal opportunities is exactly that world uh, that we have seen. And it's also the same as in Lona's uh, paper. All right, so once we are there, as I said, we, we need four objects to characterize uh, equilibrium. One is the value uh, uh, of a single. The other one is the uh, uh, mesh propensity for each man and each woman. So. Uh, four of these objects, two Vs and two Ps. Uh, there's a simple reservation match property uh, which goes through the love uh, match, uh, through the love draw. And uh, uh, nothing. I mean, I think that, you know, one sort of interesting, uh, one sort of interesting uh, property of, of the equilibrium is this rejection externality, which we're going to be using uh, for, for the proofs. And basically this is uh, simply saying that uh, a rejector of a, particular, of, for a, of a particular offer does not take into account the fact that uh, the suitor, the one who has proposed, uh, will have a loss in surplus. And you know, just very simply, uh, this is, uh, you know, suppose that all women become more selective for whatever reason, uh, then PF, their uh, match propensities will go down. So each man will then be worse off. Uh, he finds it harder to meet um, a partner who's willing to match. And therefore, each man will respond by uh, becoming less selective in the marriage market. But then this will also make women further better off. So this, in a sense, is the essence of, of how uh, we are going to be getting the equilibrium. We're going to have, presumably, multiple equilibria. Uh, and uh, um, but so we are able to show that a matching equilibrium with an equal opportunities exists. Uh, in the world in which there are equal opportunities. So, just ask about the, so, so in the, uh, you said this is the same as the Burdett Coles uh, 97, right? Yes. But do, do they have this as well, that there's multiple equilibria in their uh, setup? This is the class uh, paper. Yes. So yes. I didn't know it. Okay. Yes, yes, absolutely. 
So in the world in which you have instead equal opportunities. That's right. And, uh, and indeed here is, is your point, Costas. You know, think of, uh, think of Z as being defined in this way. Let's call it fitness. So now, OK, uh, one step back. Now there are equal opportunities. Women can go to the labor market and earn something which is above Y under bar. Uh, and therefore, at that point, each woman will have two characteristics, W and N. Now, uh, if you define this as her fitness, right, then the maze payoff can be indeed reparametrized with only one characteristic, C. That's exactly the way we do it. On the other hand, as you can see, uh, the woman's payoff is going to depend both on the uh, guys, on, on her partner's earnings, as well as on her own earnings. Right? Mm -hmm. that I can see that the labor duty in terms of analytics but it could, uh, I, I think it's would, it would be an assumption would be nice to relax mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah why is it difficult the, the, um, they're still going to agree on the ranking right yes there's no, no notion of ranking well it's, it's, but, but exactly I mean now, now the ranking is much more complicated right um Yeah. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll try. If I can, I'll try. Yeah. Do I, uh, have, have, I not, have I not resolved already all, all your, all your uh, uh, issues ap apart from Victor's? I mean, I believe that everyone else was, uh, was already happy. All right, so uh, with equal opportunities, the sort of world that we have is pretty much the same, despite the fact that now we have two, um, 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 you know, the, the women have, 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 have a labor market option. Uh, and again, we are going to be able to show that there is a, uh, a match in equilibrium with equal opportunities that does exist. All right, so here I call it calibration. I think it's uh, unfair to those who are uh, doing a lot of calibration. We are simply trying to interpret uh, what's happening uh, in the model. So it's useful to think of two types of women, women who've got a wage that is above uh, the um, um, childcare costs and which we call career women and homemakers whose uh, wages are below the uh, childcare costs. Now, with women with high ability, whose alpha is above uh, uh, phi over lambda, uh, then the education, they will get educated. And uh, they, uh, they, the education will have two effects. Um, it will raise uh, their earnings. Um, and, um, and of course, this will, uh, um, will only be biting in a world where there are uh, equal opportunities, because that's where the woman's uh, um, wage will be equal to lambda alpha, which is greater than uh, phi. And it will also increase her fitness in the single market, and therefore it becomes more desirable to men, uh, because her uh, total fitness, in fact, is, is bigger than what she would have. Uh, um, uh, if she doesn't get educated. Um, all right, so low ability women instead uh, will have limited returns in education. Uh, they will not uh, improve their fitness in the marriage market and through that also increase their wages. Uh, in, in the, so the increase in, in wages for them will only happen in the singles market once they get married. Uh, all of this uh, investment in education will get uh, dissipated. Now, in order to do some very simple computations, we assume love to be exponentially distributed. So the age function uh, is actually exponential with parameter delta. And uh, 
we normalize the uh, flow payoff of being single, U, the stuff that we uh, use to approximate the introduction of the, uh, of the peel, if you want, uh, to uh, average love, uh, 1 over delta. Um, we do quite a lot of normalizations, um, you will see. So marital sorting is another characteristic that we want to be able to replicate, or at least we want to take into account in this exercise. Uh, delta, this, this uh, exponential parameter, will be, uh, I mean, can be identified through the correlation of premarital incomes uh, between matched partners. On attractiveness, we know nothing from the data we have. Um, and um, we are basically saying, OK, there are, suppose there are two types uh, which occur with equal probability. Um, what matters uh, is, is the sort of uh, relative magnitude of the, uh, um, you know, in order to be able to pin down uh, something meaningful about n, uh, the, the um, um, uh, attractiveness parameter um, characteristic, um, we, w what matters is the relative magnitude of delta to, to n itself. So we're basically saying, OK, we set n uh, also to 1 over delta, which is also happens to be the standard deviation of the, of the exponential distribution. So all of these uh, magnitudes, uh, in a sense, are of the same uh, order. OK, so it's, a, it's an assumption. We just assume it. We're just saying, OK, suppose that you know, it's, it's like that, then it becomes fairly easy to do our, our relatively simple. As I say, I call it calibration, but I should actually substitute that with a different, better word. Um, so here we have a discount rate of, of 4%. The return to education is again also 4%, so lambda is 1.04. Uh, uh, we have, we have, we, we impose a, uh, an equivalent scale of 2.1 for a family of two, uh, pretty standard in the inequality literature, so that beta will be 0.48. Fraction of women uh, going to college coming from the data, uh, 0.25, and uh, the Correlation of, uh, of, of, of income between partners is 0.5. We have been playing a bit around with this with some lower bounds and some other, I mean, with, with values that are below 0.5 and values that are about 0.75. Nothing really changes dramatically uh, with that. And then we impose the childcare costs uh, to be um, of about $11,000. Uh, um, all right, uh, per child. So then, you know, th these are uh, sort of moments that we are trying to target. So this 4% education, you mean, is that, I mean, is that low because of the model to the object? The, the, this, this value here? It's a, it's a, as I say, this is, I mean, this is very preliminary. I mean, you know, we are not, we, we certainly have to play a bit more around with, with values here. Uh, and, you know, we are not really, I mean, we have done okay, although as you can see, we're very much off uh, um, the log of, uh, of, of male earnings here by, by a bit. Um, and we're doing much better on the age of first birth for high ability and low ability women, or high education, I should have said, and low education women. Uh, and, um, and we are OK with also with the standard deviation in the, uh, in the, uh, log, I mean in, in the earnings distribution of males. We don't have the distribution uh, of female earnings, because we simply assume that if everything gets, you know, if all women get educated and you deflate, uh, uh, you know, so assuming there are the same distribution, the same productivity distribution for women as for men, and if you deflate uh, their earnings by, uh, or inflate their earnings by 1.04, you'll have, if, as long as they all invest in, uh, uh, in education, then you say you have exactly, you, you can back out exactly the same distribution as the males. So in this room, age at first new age and age at first birth are the same? Uh, Agent. Yes, yes. I mean, f you know, conceptually, uh, in the model, when you get married, you have children. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Absolutely. Right. Risk preferences play a role. 
Uh, so. No, no. There is no risk in here. Lots of distributions floating around. You're right. Uh, but there is no other, you know, no, no. The, as you can see, you know, we, we have, you know, these this linear payoffs. Uh, and uh, there is no risk involved. You know, quite a lot of the action we get it through these assumptions, you know, through this and through pinning down uh, attractiveness with the standard deviation of that, uh, of the distribution of, of love. But, you know, we don't get it. We don't get it otherwise. I mean, we don't get anything more than that. Okay, so just to illustrate very quickly, we are able to sort of recover some of the, you know, some of the key parameters we, we believe are sort of driving uh, what we have. Interestingly, when I was watching this, mo when I, you know, the first presentation this morning, Betsy, uh, you know, the, the educational costs seem to be matching up their estimations. These, these are for the four year uh, of college. They have about $12,000 per year. Uh, it's amazing, but you know, okay, and we get it. Uh, so anyway, so what do we get here? Well, uh, the, the, the estimation of gamma, the contact rate per year is six. So people meet uh, opposite sex, uh, interesting individuals every two months. Uh, um, it doesn't mean that you get a partner every two months. Why? Because there are lots of other things that, that happen. You know, we, we, have, we have these love draws uh, as well. Searching for love, the returns to searching for love are pretty high, $9,000 per, per year. Each child uh, will also give a flow value of $23,000. Uh, so, so basically, once we factor all of this stuff in, we we can compute the uh, average time to find an agreeable partner, which is about 4.5 years. Whether or not this matches with uh, statistics that are out there, I don't know. Uh, but that's the sort of stuff that we have. And here, we are think, I think we go back to some of Joran's point. Uh, low ability women who are uh, you know, um, um, high types fully monetize uh, the man's valuation for attractiveness, in a sense, uh, in, in the sense that they, 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 uh, they can achieve this by becoming more selective in the, in the marriage market. They are, they are gorgeous. Uh, high ability women, regardless of their, uh, uh, of their attractiveness instead, will always have an incentive to, uh, to invest in education because their earnings will always have uh, greater returns, uh, will have greater returns than the returns to attractiveness. Um, OK, I think we should be uh, going faster there. I just wanted to, to illustrate you the two exercises we have very quickly. Uh, sorry, Flavio. I mean, uh, one is the impact of equal opportunities. When we move from no uh, uh, opportunities in the labor market to equal opportunities, we, we basically see that uh, most women will benefit out of this. Uh, uh, a big chunk of them get educated and uh, uh, in ways that are, I mean, I don't have here the, the numbers, unfortunately, but in ways that are matching very close, relatively closely, uh, the observed uh, uh, college rates that we have observed at the beginning. Uh, of course, some of them are worse off. Not all of them will be better off. Who are they? Well, are those at the bottom of the uh, ability distributions. And this pretty much happens for both uh, better looking and less better looking women. Um, and um, equal opportunity is, gives these women very little value in the labor market and doesn't improve. In fact, it worsens their prospects in the, in the marriage market. The impact in, in improved contraception instead, uh, we, we do this by increasing the value of U. Uh, so if, if the value of U is, uh, this is again totally arbitrary. We say, okay, suppose that U goes up by 500 per year, is about $10, $10 per week. What happens? Uh, after we're done all these adjustments, we basically see that uh, the changes in, in, in all the relevant statistics that we are interested in uh, are very, very small, very tiny. So all the changes in equilibrium match rates, as well as in participation rates, as well as in education rates, are basically negligible. So in absence of equal opportunities, we find basically no effect. The peel doesn't affect, uh, doesn't lead to the changes in, uh, uh, in 
uh, in labor market participation or, or, or education uh, as we have observed in the data. Uh, one second, second. Oh yeah, it could, absolutely, absolutely. This is this is tiny. I mean. Let me say that I don't see why you're sitting giving all these details when you said we shouldn't take it seriously. We shouldn't either. So there are two things we can plan. You show an example, or you move, or you confirm the data already. But the thought is, it's a lot better. It's tell us why this model captures the the right market. That's why you want you want to tell us, and then eventually. You go to the data. Yes. Okay. So, so, so yeah, I mean, at this point. Me, so tell me, what makes this model great? So I can, so I can leave this room saying, yes, this guy put these ingredients there that are, that are important and nice. Well, it's probably here if you want. I mean, we are trying to formulate this uh, equilibrium search model in which you have both educational choice and family formation as the choices, uh, relevant choices, something that very few people have done. In fact, no one has done. Uh, I have something with Melvin uh, where we are trying to do a little bit of this, but we don't have educational choices uh, um, as, as, as a choice. We describe, therefore, not just the sorting, but also when you get married. Something which, again, the matching literature doesn't care at all. Most of the attention that we have done, that we had so far in the literature, is on who matches whom. Is the sorting bit. But very little is actually on the when. And we believe that this is essential in order to be able to match the, or understand those trends that I showed you at the beginning with these very long, flat trends on, uh, on age at first birth, conditional having. On, on having a child. And you may argue that this might not be enough, but you know, that's so far what we believe is the important bit. Now, once we, once we are able to pin it down maybe better, and once we have some better understanding of the data, we might want to go to really some sort of serious calibration results, which right now are only preliminary, and then being able to, to assess better these policy changes, if you want. But so far, the preliminary results are basically saying, well, look, you know, innovation in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the contraceptive technology seem to have had very little to, to do with the changes that we have observed uh, over the 1950s and 60s and 70s in labor market participation of women and uh, education. So, you know, it's not that there is uh, nothing happening there. It, it does happen, you know, something that I wanted to say here. When there are equal opportunities, then the changes are not trivial. I know it's minus three, but you know changes are not trivial. But uh, they cannot happen in a vacuum. And you know the stuff that is really very important is what happened, you know, with the cultural changes that since the Second World War happened in the U.S. And it's only there uh, that you start seeing changes. Otherwise, it's like looking at the vulcanized rubber uh, or uh, you know the legalization of, uh, of of condom. Nothing really happened to women's labor market participation there.